Welcome to New Horizons Community Church's presentation of A Better Life, and we are thrilled that you are here. Grab your Bible and join our congregation as we look to the Word of God for truths that are for our lives today. Thanks for coming. Well, good morning. Welcome to New Horizons Community Church. For those watching online or tuning in on your cable access program, we're starting a brand new series called Guardrails. And if you can't remember the name of the series, this one should really, really be unforgettable. Now, Pastor Brian and I are pretty excited about this. If you have any experience in a vehicle, you probably know what a guardrail is. But what you may not know is the official definition of a guardrail. Now, before I get into this, for those of you that are grammar people, and you know who you are, you already know, you're like, oh, I'm one of those people. You might, there's a possibility you might get a little bent out of shape over this whole series. Um, so let me just go ahead and kind of tell you right up front that guardrail can be two words, and it can be one word, okay? So just, you'll have to deal with that. So if you thought it was one way or the other, we can work it both ways. Um, in our literature, we use it both ways just so that everyone is happy and it bothers everybody else. So equal opportunity here. A guardrail in your notes, a guardrail is actually a system designed to keep vehicles from straying into dangerous or off-limit areas. Okay? That's a guardrail. And you use them all the time. Well, okay, you don't use them all the time, but they're there all the time. We see them. You've been impacted by them. They're simply a system. This entire system of guardrails is designed to keep vehicles from straying. And that's the word we're really going to kind of key off of, straying. From straying into dangerous or off-limit areas. The interesting point is, nobody really pays attention to guardrails unless you need one. Right? There are all different kinds of guardrails. Um, the pastor and I, we were going to show you a bunch of different kinds of pictures, but it's largely irrelevant. So, uh, Guardrails are that invisible part of our driving experience. We're really glad they're there when we need them, but for the large part, we pay no attention to them whatsoever. You generally find guardrails in one of three areas. You find guardrails on bridges, because on a bridge, there's a very, very small or little margin of error. You also find them in medians, median strips, where we're very, very close to other people moving in the opposite direction. And the closer we are to people who are moving in the opposite direction, the more we need protection. Now, the third area where you find guardrails specifically is around curves or unexpected changes in the roadside conditions which if you've ever traveled up to the Forks, when you get past Bingham, you know on 201 that it gets really windy and it's some pretty hairpin turns in there. We're, glad, we're really glad for guardrails right there in those spots. Now, the really interesting thing about guardrails, and again, this is kind of what we're going to key off of in this series, is that generally speaking, guardrails are not located in the most dangerous part of the road. Guardrails are located and built or constructed in areas where you actually could drive, if you think about it. See, because the point of a guardrail isn't to say, don't drive here. The point of a guardrail is to say that the piece of real estate beyond the guardrail, that's the point of danger. There might be oncoming traffic, curves, mountainside edge of bridges, or whatever it might be. So generally speaking, guardrails are actually considered in areas where theoretically and actually you could drive, but guardrails are there to keep us from moving into the area where there's actual danger. But when it comes to guardrails, nobody really argues the point and says, hey, I don't know why they put guardrails around the edge of the bridge. They need to take the guardrails off because I could and I want to. I want to drive closer to the edge of the bridge if they would just move those silly little guardrails. No one says that. We understand in driving that there needs to be some margin of error. There needs to be a little margin of error. And the theory, or I guess you would say the prevailing idea behind a guardrail, is that you will do less damage to your body, and in some cases even less damage to your car, 
or less damage to the existing infrastructure, less damage to potentially other people if you hit a guardrail than if you actually hit what was on the other side of the guardrail. Okay, staying with me? It makes sense. Okay. Or if you actually went off the side of something that would cause damage to you or your car. So the whole idea is that it's better to cause a little bit of damage in order to keep you from creating or experiencing a lot of damage, either to your physical body or to your car. So that's, that's the idea, or kind of the idea behind a guardrail. That's what it's for. Now, what we're going to do in the next few weeks is we're going to talk about this whole idea of guardrails as it relates not simply to driving, because that's very apparent to us. We, we understand what they're for, but rather other areas of our lives. Because the truth is, and I think we're going to build this case throughout these next few weeks as we do this series, your greatest regret relationally, your greatest regret financially, your greatest regret morally, your greatest regret ethically, and maybe even professionally, chances are your greatest regret could have been avoided. And if you think of it in terms of driving, that ditch that you went off into, or the cliff that you rolled off into relationally, however you want to describe it, in your notes, your greatest regret could probably have been avoided, and would probably have been avoided, if you had had some guardrails in your life. In your life financially, morally, relationally, in your marriage, in your parenting, and your whole perspective on authority, whatever it might be, so that what we want to do, and we want to take this, this very, very common imagery of the guardrail, and we want to apply it to several areas of your lives. Now, our definition for guardrail for this series is going to go like this. We're going to talk about a guardrail in terms of a standard of behavior. A standard of behavior. This is your... Um, I kind of like to use the, like to add the word personal in here. This is your personal standard of behavior that becomes a matter of conscience. A standard of behavior or personal standard of behavior that becomes a matter of conscience. So I want to leave that, that idea up there for just a few minutes if we could. Here's what I mean by that, by, by that whole idea uh, I want to encourage you as we talk about your marriages, uh, your marriage, your marriages, your marriage, <laughs> as we talk about your dating life, as we talk about your relationships, as we talk about your friendships, even when we're going to be talking about our time, I'm going to encourage you to develop a personal, this is just for you, this isn't for everybody else, this isn't the law that's going to be applied to everyone. I'm going to encourage you in the next few weeks to think through and develop a personal standard of behavior that becomes a matter of conscience that serves as a guardrail for you. Now, the reason that I say a matter of conscience is because of this. In driving, as I said before, the whole idea of a guardrail is that there is some damage done when you hit a guardrail, just a little bit. But it's less than the damage that would have been done if there was no guardrail at all. What we want to help you do is to develop, and some of you may have already done this already, that you may already have these up there. So I'm going to be as practical as I know how to be, and today is kind of the setup for the whole series, so I'm going to be hitting the guardrail analogy quite a bit. But I want, I want us to begin thinking in terms of a standard of behavior or behavioral practices that you are so committed to as an individual that when you violate them, it bothers your conscience. Standards of behavior that when you violate them, you would feel like you've actually done something wrong. That's the guardrail. We want to prevent you from going over the cliff, is what I'm saying. Don't go to the cliff. We're gonna, a little bit of bump on the guardrail is fine. Don't go over the cliff. It's something that you would even feel guilty about and that your guilt, your guilt level would be so associated with these, be, these behavior, these guardrails that you've established in your life financially and in your marriage and in the way that you conduct yourself with friends, whatever it might be, that it would be like a personal guardrail for you. 
And they're not for everybody. They're for you. They're yours. But still, it's a personal standard of behavior that informs or energizes or, or ignites your conscience. And as you begin to bump up against these guardrails internally, that little lights, little warning lights would go on and you know, red flags would come up and there would be something inside of you that says danger, 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 danger. Because I'm bumping up against something that if I ignore or if I continue to bump up against it, it may lead me into areas of trouble from which I might not be able to recover or from which I might live the rest of my life with regret. Because again, your greatest regret, your greatest single regret, just pick the area, it doesn't really matter. Your greatest regret could probably, it would have probably been avoided if your conscience wasn't simply tuned in to the big thing, the, oh my goodness, oh my gosh, people should never, whatever. Married people should never, fill in the blank. Single people should never, fill in the blank. And when it comes to money, we should never, whatever it is. If your conscience hadn't simply been tuned to these big ideas, but had been tuned instead to a standard of behavior that gave you a warning that you were getting too close to that big thing that now you regret. That's what we, that's what we mean when we, we, we talk about guardrails. It's a personal decision you'll make as it relates to your marriage, a personal decision that you'll make as it relates to your finances, a personal decision you make as it relates to how you conduct yourself in friendships and in dating and all of those social things, all those social aspects we have to deal with. A personal decision that informs or ignites your conscience, that becomes a standard of behavior which you live your life. Guardrails. Over the next few weeks, we're going to give you lots and lots and lots and lots of examples. Now, I like things that are universal, things that everybody can agree on, for instance. Um, in our culture, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, uh, but just to kind of put it into perspective, in our culture and in our world, there are things that pretty much most people or almost everybody agrees with are bad. You might say that in our culture, we would find consensus around these things. We as a culture ask, what is on the other side of this guardrail that everybody should avoid? And believe it or not, there is some consensus around that idea. And so in our culture, in our world, through advertising and through marketing, we get some messages that are, they're sort of culture's way of developing guardrails, but they're, they're very, very weak. They're like guard bumps, it's about that big. It's things like, um, oh, it's things like this, drink responsibly. Well, that's not bad, but that's not a guardrail, drink responsibly. That's like a, a little yellow thin line painted on the edge of a bridge. It's like, you know, true, everybody agrees that we shouldn't drink irresponsibly. We all agree there, but that's not much of a guardrail, drink responsibly. And again, I, I think myself and maybe some of you could tell a story about drinking that you weren't really sure where the line for irresponsible was, but by the time you got close to that line, you didn't care. Because that's just the nature of alcohol. That's, that's just how it goes. That's how alcohol works. So drink responsibly, that's not a bad idea, but that's not really what we're talking about here. Another one that's popular in our culture is when it comes to teenagers, young people and sex. Here's the message of our culture, our current culture. And it isn't necessarily wrong, it's just not that helpful as a guardrail. Because again, everybody in culture knows that somewhere on the other side of the guardrail sexually, there's danger involved for the, the young people. There's danger involved for teenagers that we're not really sure what it is, but we know that over there somewhere is a bad thing. So the message of culture is, don't have sex until you're ready. Now see, I don't think that's a horrible thing to say wait till you're ready. What I'm saying is that's not a guardrail. That is not a guardrail. That's a guard bump. You can step right over that sucker. And speaking as a former teenage boy, wait until you're ready, 
that's a little thin line painted way up in a road in the mountain somewhere. That's, that is, oh man. Again, it's like, it's like drink responsibly. Those are not bad ideas, but they're not guardrails either. The other one is to parents. This is, this is, this is one that's been around for about maybe five to ten years. And again, it's, it's not bad advice. Actually, it's really good advice. But it's not what we would consider to be a guardrail. Do like this. Parents, talk to your kids about drugs. Talk to them. Now, I've been teaching teenagers for the better part of ten years now. And trust me, that is not a guardrail. That's just a conversation you need to have. That is not a guardrail. And I have never met in ten years, I've never met a parent who said, well, you know, I don't really care what happens to my kids. They're all on drugs, but I talked to them. I talked to them about drugs, and it didn't work. Well, that's again because everybody in culture knows that somewhere on the other side of this guardrail, whatever it is, there's some bad stuff. But our culture, and this is where the challenge is really, really going to be for you and I, our culture does not appreciate this when it comes to these different areas. They don't like guardrails. Our culture thinks this idea of a guardrail is stupid. They think it's stupid. The people that you live and I live and I work with and on the surface, now see, once you drill down deep and you, you start to explain these things, it begins to make sense to them. And they're like, oh, that's a good idea. But for the most part, our culture thinks that this is the problem with religion, that religious people are all about these silly rules and these silly guardrails and these silly barriers. Some of you grew up in a in a religion or denomination that was super strict. You didn't recognize the guardrails that were there for you in place. They were there. They may not have been well explained to you, but they were there. They put them in place to help you. And we rebelled against those things, and we learned our lesson, because on the other side of that guardrail that they were trying to protect us from is full of regret. But see, that idea of, of dismissing them is is really stupid to the world. They just, they're, why you have guardrails? That's so dumb. You're, you're what's wrong with, with the world, they say. But see, those very same people right now would agree that over there somewhere on the other side is some really bad stuff and you should be careful. But they don't want to put a guardrail up. When it comes to money, guardrails, and the message in our culture about money that's been really, really big lately is consolidate your debts. You hear it all the time. Consolidate your debts. And again, well, that's very helpful. Again, because everybody knows that when it comes to debt and money, there's some really bad stuff. Credit cards, high interest loans, those things, that's really bad. But consolidate your debt? Is that really a guardrail? Doesn't seem like it. But doesn't that seem kind of restrictive? Doesn't that seem to be restricting all the fun? Doesn't that seem to be kind of negative to have guardrails? As we talk about these things, if there's something that rises up inside of you and says, wow, that's too something. I don't know what word to use. If you have a religious background, you might say, that's too legalistic. We're going to talk about this. This has nothing to do with legalism. Or you might say, that's too confining or too restrictive. You're not letting me have my fun. But at the same time, we all know on the other side of that guardrail, there's some really bad stuff. Whether it's marriages, money, maybe it's morally, ethically, professionally. Everybody agrees. So what I'm trying to say is, sit down and buckle up. Because over the next few weeks, you're going to get challenged to do something that many of us have done for years, and that's to establish some personal guardrails and personal standards that inform your own conscience. That when you begin to bump up against some of these behaviors that don't bother anybody else in your office, that don't bother anyone else in your school, that don't bother anyone else in the world in which you live in, they begin to bother you. Because you have some personal standard that, again, it informs or it's become a matter of conscience. Now, here's the really cool thing. 
This is why you hear Pastor Brian and myself tell you all the time, read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. I know we drone on and on. I say it almost every Sunday morning to the kids. Read your Bible. This, this concept of the guardrail is all over the Bible. In fact, it's so much a part of the Old and the New Testament that there are some passages and some of the verses that people get very, very, very confused about. Because God, who loves you, has invited you to talk to him and relate to him as a heavenly father. And here's what good fathers do. If you had a good father, your father did this. If you had a bad father, he didn't do this, and you wish that he had. If you want to be a good father, this is what you do. Good fathers say to their children, in order to keep you out of the real danger zone, I want to set up some protective barriers. And if you and I are going to have a conflict in our home, I want to have a conflict with you here. I don't want to have a conflict with you over there. Because the conflict here is much easier to resolve. The conflict over there leaves you with scars. and leaves you with memories and leaves you with things that you wish you didn't have to deal with. So in my family, my wife and I, we establish rules and boundaries for our kids. Together. We do it together. It's not, it's not I do it or she does it. We do it together. And I want to make sure that the boundaries are so far away from the edge of the abyss, whatever it may be, relationships or, or money or, or whatever it is, I want, to, I want the barriers and the boundaries to be so far away from that, if we're going to have a conflict, we're going to have a little bitty fender bender rack, just a tiny one that I want it to happen on a guardrail as opposed to going over a cliff where sometimes people never, ever recover. And the really interesting thing is, this is all over the Scripture. But if God really loves you, and if God wants to relate to you as your Heavenly Father, isn't that what we would expect Him to do? To establish guardrails? Isn't that what you would expect? The answer is yes. Because he is a good, good father. Now here's the other bit of really good news. If you're listening, or you're here, and you're not a religious person, or you're not really a a Christian person, that's okay. I'm really glad you're here this morning. Maybe maybe you don't know where you stand on the, the whole God and Jesus and being saved from your sins thing. That's okay. I'm very glad that you're here. The good news for you is that this message, this lesson, is it's kind of a freebie. It's going to work wherever you are. It's going to work for you also. You don't have to have any religious convictions or any religious beliefs for you to apply the principle of the guardrail. For you to establish some sort of personal standards of behavior that inform or become a matter of conscience for you. But as you begin... Maybe you sit through this series and go, huh, wow. You know, I'm still not sure about the the Jesus part and, and the Bible part, but wow, this is actually practical. It's useful. Then here's what I would like for you to sit and think about as you sit through this series. Think, wow, that's in the Bible. Maybe I should read it. And the answer is yes. Maybe you should read it. And you say, well, I don't believe that the Bible is true. That's fine. See, that's not the litmus test you use for anything that you read. You don't read anything because you think it's true. Well, maybe your journal, that's about it. But everything you read, you're suspect. So read the Bible as literature if you want to. But read the Bible, read the scripture. I know this is is a really long intro, but I need to set up the principle and I need us to get the idea of the guardrail for the next few weeks. Now today, what I want to do is take you to one of my favorite passages. It's in the book of Ephesians chapter 5, which is in the New Testament. And if you are in my Sunday school class, you know that I say Genesis, Exodus, Ephesians. Those are not the actual orders, but it makes the kids look at the books. So it's in the New Testament, past the Gospels. Ephesians, we're going to go to chapter 5. Now Ephesians is simply a letter that the Apostle Paul, great guy by the way, He wrote this to the new Christians in the ancient city of Ephesus. Now, something that is really, really neat is you can actually go visit Ephesus today. And you can see where 
uh, Paul did all this really kind of neat stuff. It's, a, it's, a, it's rather an, an interesting ancient city that it used to be on the coast of Turkey, but now the coast has moved uh, out from the city, actually, because there's a local river that deposited all of its silt on the bottom and filled in the bay where Ephesus was. So now Ephesus is located in the middle of land. Um, it's east of uh, Athens, Greece, about 200 miles south of Istanbul. So that's the area we're talking about now. Oh, but anyway, I, I like that kind of stuff. Anyway, um, Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to begin with verse 15. Ephesians 5, 15. But I want to kind of set this up for us. So in the fifth chapter of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul is talking to a group of people. And it's kind of hard to imagine, but these people lived in a culture that was even more amoral or, or immoral than our own current culture. Think of it as the modern-day Las Vegas sin city. That's the kind of culture we're talking about there. In fact, you can visit Ephesus today and see evidence of just how immoral it was. What we today would consider infidelity, or what we would consider adultery, and even in our, our loose kind of culture we have now, was considered common. And it was even acceptable, because in that culture, having extramarital affairs or extramarital sex was part of a religious experience. That's pretty bad. So in this culture, the Apostle Paul goes through kind of a, a list of things to be careful. Don't do this. That kind of list. And to be honest, it's stuff that we would expect. You know, it's things like uh, don't have any extra relationships or you're going to destroy your marriage. Be kind to people. It's those kinds of things. He kind of goes through this whole list of things. But at the end the list gets pretty stringent. And Paul, being a great writer, sensed that his audience was going to ask him questions, just like many of us ask. It's like, okay, Paul, it's hard to disagree with you on being honest. We agree with that. It's hard to disagree with you on being faithful to my husband or wife. We agree with that. It's hard to disagree. I believe all that stuff, but how? In a culture that doesn't reward marital faithfulness, how, in a culture that works off bribes, how, in a culture where nobody values any of the things you just asked us to do, how do we pull that off? And so, in these verses we're going to read, Paul is explaining how a person avoids the ditches to the left and to the right. How a person avoids rolling his car off the side of a mountain. How a person stays between the lines and in between the guardrails. And in doing so, he explains the principle of the guardrail. Now, obviously, they didn't have guardrails back then like we have today. It's hard to run your donkey off the side of a mountain. But here's the most, the most interesting part of the verse, of this passage. He gives us an example, and the example, for some of you, is going to be a little disturbing. For me, it's not so disturbing because I read it. But and I'll, I'll explain that in a few minutes. So hang with me. Here we go. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. Here's what he says. Be very careful then. And the word then is there because this is following a whole list of things he said Christians ought to do. Be very careful then. You know what careful means. How you live. Be very careful then how you live. And the little Greek word there, live, it really means walk. It means walk. And actually, in fact, uh, if you have a different translation of the Bible, it may, be, it may mean be very careful in how you walk. It may actually be written as walk or live. But when I read this verse, something, something kind of gross comes to mind. And I'll, I'll explain this to you. If you have pets, you can understand this. But here's what this means literally, what Paul is saying. Let me give you a, a, a real-world example. Now, some of you already may know where I'm going with this, but Pastor and Karen, they have three dogs. They've got two little basset hounds, or big basset hounds, and they've got a Jack Russell jumpy dog. Now, in the morning, when Pastor and Karen, they let these dogs out, they're kind of, well, they're dogs. They do dog things, you know. They both go out in the morning, and they, they do their morning business, and they do it in the same spot, 
of grass every morning. That's their dog. So in pastor's family, when people come to their house and they're all out on the back porch and then they go out on the back lawn and the backyard to go for a walk, they have to say, be careful. And people say, why? And they say, well, that's the danger area over there. Because every, every morning our three dogs, just be careful where you walk. That's what that verse means. That's what, he, that's what Paul is telling us. Be very careful. That is, the rest of the yard is fine, but be careful over there. I don't have to go into details. You know what I'm talking about. But that's the, that's the idea that Paul, and Paul doesn't have dogs in mind here, but that's, that's the idea. He's saying, as you live your life, as you walk through relationships, as you deal with money, as you deal with people, as you are dealing with your marriage, or engagement, or whatever it might be. Be very careful how you walk. Why? Well, then he says in the middle of verse 15, not as unwise. Unwise means careless. That's what it means, like I couldn't care less. But as wise, that is, with your eyes wide open. Verse 16, making the most of every opportunity, which literally means it literally means redeeming your time. Which in our culture means, this is really what this idea is, is means being very intentional. That's the word we want to use. Be very, very intentional with how you use your time. He says, because of the things that I've told you to do, because of the life that God wants you to lead, because God wants to protect you and direct you, then as you live your life, in every arena of life, be careful don't be careless, don't be a fool, but pay attention to how you're living your life. Pay attention to how you walk, to where you walk. Pay attention to what's happening in your time, what's happening to your time. Because here's the reason, Ephesians 5, 16, because the days are very evil. Paul says, you Ephesians, now this is a couple thousand years ago, he says, you Ephesians, you're living in dangerous times. If you're not careful, you'll roll your car. If you're not careful, you're going to go into one of the two ditches on either side of the road. If you're not careful, if you're careless, if you don't pay attention, if you think, oh, it's just all going to work out, things always just work out for me. If you're not careful, there will be a price to pay because the days are evil. Now, I don't think I have to spend a lot of time convincing you just how evil and dangerous the days are that we live in today. If you've opened the paper any time in the last couple of weeks, you've seen some pretty dangerous things. Talk about how bad our culture is. Now, financially, some of you have debts. You can't imagine how you got so much debt and you're just trying to deal with the debt. You can't give. You can't be generous. You can't live the way you want to live. Then on top of the debt, here comes our economy, and you're just upside down financially. These are dangerous, dangerous days to live in financially. You've got to be careful. I don't have to tell you that. Morally, it's the same way. In your marriage, it's the same way. The way you deal with your kids, the way you deal with temptation, there's no difference. He's saying, because we live in a dangerous world morally, a dangerous world ethically, a dangerous world professionally, a dangerous world financially, marriage is less and less respected every day. Whatever it might be. Because we live in a dangerous, dangerous time. He says, you have got to be careful how you live and how you walk. Verse 17. Therefore, here's his first command, do not be foolish. Do not be foolish or careless, as some read. But, and this is where it gets kind of neat, but it's a great contrast. But's a contrast, 17. He says, but understand what the Lord's will is. Now, what Paul does here, this is a little tricky Greek thing that he does. Leave it to Paul to be a little trickster. Where he actually uses, uh, today we use an English word that doesn't make sense in this context. I've always read this, this verse, and it's, it's always, understand what the, the Lord's will is. He commands us to understand something. Understand. Which doesn't make any sense at all. Because I don't know what it is. He says, understand. So 
Let me try and explain it maybe in a different way. Some of you may have to think back, but do you remember when you were a kid? Some of you, it's been a long time, it's okay. Don't laugh too hard. They, they used to do this in school, and it was terrifying, but you, where you were called up to go to the board, right? They'd call out your name, and they'd say, well, they'd say to me, they're like, Aaron, you do problem three, and Brett, you do you know, problem number four. And they'd send you both up to the board, and you go up your math book, and you get up there, and you're like, uh-oh. Oh, this isn't good. This is terrible. And you look back and look to your teacher and you're like, I can't do the third problem. I don't understand it. And your teacher says what? Understand. Understand. It's like, okay, you can't command me to understand because I don't know. That's not how it works. You can't just tell me to understand. And Paul takes this little Greek word and he uses it in that odd way. He says to Christians, he says, for those of us who are Christians, he says, I want you to understand what the Lord's will is. And here's what he's saying. This is, this is a big, big idea. It's a giant idea. Wish we could just plaster it everywhere. He's saying to you and he's saying to me, I want you to face up to. I want you to accept. I want you to embrace what you know in your heart God's will for your life is. That's what he's saying. I want you to face up to. I want you to embrace. I want you to accept what you know God's plan for you is as it relates to your money, as it relates to your marriage, to your dating relationships, to your friendships, to the way you spend your time. Paul is saying this. I want you to stop deceiving yourself. I want you to stop playing games. I want you to stop smearing and smothering everything over. I want you to face up to what you know God's will for your life is. Here's how it works in our illustration. He's saying, look, I want you to be honest with yourself. You know what's on the other side of this guardrail financially. You know what's on the other side morally. You know what could happen to your marriage. You know what could happen to your physical body if you don't change some things. You know already you don't need new information. I want you to stop. And I want you to face up to what you know God's will is for your life. What God's will is for your body. What God's will is for your marriage. God's will for these different areas of your life. I want you to quit deceiving yourself and face up to what you know God's will is. Now for some of us, this is a big giant two by four upside the head. Because all of us, Christians, non Christians, churched and unchurched, all of us people, we have a tendency to play as close as we can to the edge of disaster in many areas of our lives. And we know that this to be true because we all do it. We know exactly where the little yellow line is, and we know exactly where the abyss is financially and in other different areas of our lives. And our tendency as people is to get close, really, really close, as close as we can, as close as we can, and we get a little closer. We get as close to that line as possible to dance on the edge of chaos financially, to dance on the edge of chaos morally. Well, I didn't touch him. I didn't touch her. Well, I, I mean, how close to sin, if you're a Christian, how close to sin can I get without sinning? is kind of the way we live our lives sometimes. Don't we? We've been there. Exactly where is the line? We want to know where the line is. So we can be like, I can go right up to it and not cross it. We want to know that. And Paul says, all right, okay, okay, look. You live in a dangerous culture. You live in a dangerous age. You have got to quit flirting with disaster. And face it to what you know in your heart that God wants you to do. And face it to what you know in your heart God wants you to be. Quit messing around. That's what he's saying. Quit messing around. And then he gives us this illustration. So here's this, here's, here is Paul's illustration to us. Ephesians 5.18 says, Do not get drunk on wine. Paul, he's introducing this idea of, okay, all right, all right. Let's all wake up and be real honest. 
this is what he's saying. Let's be honest. We all know on the other side of the guardrail is something nobody wants. So let's be honest about that. And let's set up some guardrails so that if we have a crash, if we have some conscience crashes, we don't destroy our lives. In the first illustration, he uses alcohol. So he says this, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Well, that clears things up completely, doesn't it? Most people don't even know what that word means. Sometimes I was talking to a coworker, and it's like, oh, I, I love the Bible, because when I think I'm going to get convicted, like they're going to tell me something I really shouldn't do, I just don't understand that word. I'm like, great. He's like, oh, I can just move on, and I don't feel anything. Well, you could use a dictionary, but anyway. But, but here's what he's about to do. He, and I'm going to give you the definition for debauchery in just, just a few minutes. Here's what I want you to do. This is what I want you to hear. I don't want anyone to miss this. And for those of you, you're like, it's about time someone talked about alcohol in the church. But for those of you that, keep going, for those of you that only don't drink on Sunday, you're thinking, uh-oh, here we go. But I want, I want us all to hear exactly what Paul is teaching. Here's what he's teaching. Paul is about to explain to us that drunkenness is a guardrail. In other words, Paul is about to say, Christian, he's talking to Christians, so if you're not a Christian, I'll give you the out, don't worry. He says, Christians, I don't want you to get drunk. I want you to set a personal standard. Here's his first illustration. I want you to set a personal standard of behavior that you decide you're not going to get drunk. And the reason I don't want you to get drunk is not because being drunk is a sin. I know a lot of people, have, I've had questions about a lot, a lot of people like me to say that being drunk is a sin. Here's what Paul argues. Getting drunk is foolish. It's stupid, is what he's going to argue. Getting drunk is irresponsible, is what he's going to argue. He says, I want you to decide you're not going to get drunk because getting drunk leads to something you don't want to be a part of. In fact, getting drunk leads to something that most people agree people shouldn't be involved with. So Christian, I want you to establish a guardrail. And your guardrail is, I'm not going to be a drunk. I'm not going to get drunk. He says, I want you to hardwire your conscience into the issue of being controlled by alcohol so that if you're ever at a point in your life or you're ever at a night or a weekend, or a weekday, or whatever it is, that you really realize, oh my goodness, I'm giving up control of my life and my behavior to alcohol, that that would bother you so much that it would be like hitting a guardrail that causes you not to go beyond what's on the other side. That's what Paul's teaching, that drunkenness is an example of establishing a guardrail, because drunkenness leads to debauchery. And debauchery is the problem. Well, what the heck is debauchery? What is that? So let me read to you the official definition of debauchery. It reads like this. Extreme indulgence that results in a loss of control. That is debauchery. Extreme indulgence or indulgence that leads to a loss of control. Now, as you read the Bible, and again, if God is our Heavenly Father... None of this should come as a surprise. As you read the scripture, you discover that whether it's lust, alcohol, greed, anger, food, material possessions, anything in our lives that leads us to a loss of control, anything that baits us towards things that we don't need to be involved in, to where we're just so lustful we can hardly keep ourselves together, that we're we're so greedy we can hardly help ourselves. You know, it, it could be, you know, for instance, I want that car so badly, I'm willing to sacrifice my children's education, sacrifice financial integrity to get the car. Whatever it is, fill the, take the car out, put whatever it is, anything, you, whatever it is for you. Anything that, that lives, that baits us, or draws us to a point where we're almost, or in some cases, in fact, we do lose control. Anything that's like that, your and my Heavenly Father is against it. And you know why? It's the same reason you'd be against it for your own kids. Because on the other side of this is disaster. 
So what Paul is saying is this. Look, for example, any area of your life where you have a tendency to hand control over to somebody or something else, you need a guardrail. You need a guardrail. And in Paul's illustration, alcohol, by its very nature, can lead everybody to a point of a loss of control. He says, then you need to set up a boundary. You need to decide that drunkenness for you is wrong. Is drunkenness a sin? I don't know. It's foolish. It's really irresponsible. Is drunkenness so bad that God's love is not going to love you if you're drunk? That's not what Paul says. That's not what he's saying. He's saying it's a guardrail. You need to understand it's a guardrail. And I think he chooses this one because it's common to all of us. We can relate to it on some level. It's something we can all relate to, but it's just one illustration of what he's teaching, the principle that he's teaching. When he says, be careful how you walk, because the days in which we live are dangerous. Don't get drunk on wine. Why? Because it leads to a loss of control. And the loss of control is a sin. And the loss of control has led some of us and some of you to your greatest regrets. A loss of control in someone else's life has been a disaster in your life. Don't ever do anything that leads you to a point where you just can't help yourself. He said, that's the problem. And when you recognize it, you need a guardrail. And listen to what Paul contrasts it with because it emphasizes the point. Instead, he says in verse 18, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, our contrast, be filled with the Spirit. The point Paul is making is that God, and if you read your Bible, you know this, our Heavenly Father wants to be the top, the head, the chief influencer in your life. Not alcohol. He doesn't want that or anything else. And God doesn't speak out loud to all of us every single day of the week. That would be rather interesting, but it just doesn't happen. I think it would be rather intimidating, actually. But that's not how he does it. But the Bible teaches that when you put your faith in Christ, that the Spirit of God comes to live in you in a very unique way and in a very different way. And that the Holy Spirit inside of you will prompt you, will guide you, and will direct you. The Holy Spirit, in my experience, and in talking to so many other people, the Holy Spirit never yells. The Holy Spirit doesn't scream. The Holy Spirit usually goes, <clears throat> that's about it. <clears throat> it's like getting closer to that guardrail and getting closer and closer, and the Holy Spirit goes, <clears throat> it's like, well, wake up. It's just a small, small voice in our conscience. It's the voice, it's the voice, it's the megaphone of the Holy Spirit. It's just a, <clears throat> pay attention, wake up. Our conscience. And God just gives us a little elbow in the conscience. Come on. What are you doing? You know better than that. And we know. We know, don't we? You know exactly what I'm talking about. We all know that. We know what it's like to get a nudge in our conscience. That's why Paul says this. He says, come on. Face up to what you know God wants for you and quit playing silly games. And quit hiding in the dark and going, well, my mama used to do this and well, my dad did this and my uncle was a drunk and we, I come from a line of drunks. And He says, well, no, no. Well, you can, can convince everyone else, but you cannot convince God. Face up to what you know God wants for you. And when you sense that little elbow in your conscience, and when you sense that still, small voice, and when you sense that warning going on inside, Paul's saying, come on, your life is too important, time is too short, and the world's too dangerous, so pay attention. Pay attention, pay attention, pay attention, and be careful, stop playing games. Because here's what I know about you, and what I know about all of us. None of us, none of us plan to mess up our lives. We don't intentionally play in that. No one has ever stood up at the altar and said his or her vows in the midst of their mind saying, I can't wait to get married because I'm really going to screw this one up. That's never anybody's plan. But here's the conclusion that Pastor Hale and I have come to, is that after a lot of years of doing this and talking with people, 
Nobody plans to mess up a marriage. A lot of people never plan not to. And that's where we find our problem. They never establish a guardrail. Nobody plans to mess up their bodies physically, but a lot of people have. Because they never really plan not to. They didn't have any guardrails. They didn't have anyone speaking into their lives, helping them out. Nobody plans to mess up any kind of relationship or any kind of friendship that's not meaningful to them. A relationship with a child, a relationship with a, with a grandchild or a grandparent, a relationship with a parent. No, nobody sits up in the room at the start and says, how can I totally sabotage this relationship? How do I break my mother's heart? How do I disappoint my father? How am I, how am I going to break my mother's heart? It's never a plan. We just don't plan not to. We don't plan not to because we never establish a guardrail. We think a, a little thin yellow line like drink responsibly or wait till you're ready or talk to your kids about drugs. We think that's going to work. It's not going to work. It's never worked. You need a guardrail. And please, 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 please don't insult yourself by saying, well, I think God will protect me. This is how God protects you. This is how it works. Don't say, oh, well, I'll just be careful. Everybody says that, and look what happens to everybody. So consequently, your heavenly Father, because he says he loves you, says, look, I want you to be careful how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. Not as foolish, but as wise. I want you to take advantage of every opportunity. I want you to redeem the time, your time. I want you to face up to what God wants in your lives. And I want you to establish boundaries. These are for you. This isn't a, a get on the street corner and tell everyone what to do kind of thing. You need personal standards for you. You need personal standards that become a matter of conscience. And when someone else in your group and everyone else is at the office and maybe everyone else in your family says, oh, what, you, you're not going to do whatever, whatever it is. Is that because you're a Christian? Do you, do you think that's a sin? Do you think it's wrong? And then somehow, through your own personality, with your own language, you're going to basically say, no, I'm not saying you shouldn't. I'm not saying for the rest of the world shouldn't either. I'm just saying for me, this is as far as I will allow myself to go in this area. And you can borrow all the money you want to borrow, but for my family, this is as far and I know legally I can do more, but for me personally, this is as far as I go. This is my guardrail. I know everyone else, but for me, I've set a personal standard that has informed my conscience that when I begin to bump up against my personal standard, I feel as if I've done something wrong. And by establishing that standard for me, I've decided this is how God wants to guard me from whatever is on the other side that ultimately everyone agrees with. Nobody should even go in that area. You don't like the area, I've actually set up a guardrail. This is something that we're going to do. We're going to do this. For the next few weeks, we're going we're to take a look at some different areas, some very specific things. We're going to talk about time. We're going to talk about friendships. We're going to talk about marriage. And as our hearts are continually broken through the years by people whose lives have become broken unnecessarily, this is going to be a very passionate point for us. I know people that have broken, broken my heart and my life. You've had it too. And I think we're going to have a lot to say. So make sure you get involved in a life group. Because you're going to want to talk about this. So it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be stretching. But that's where this series is going. But here's where I really want to land us all today. I want to land on something pretty solid. As I've been talking, for some of you, something very specific has come to mind. It may have been the alcohol thing. It may have had nothing to do with alcohol. Because you know there's an area in your life where you're dancing on the edge of the yellow line. And you need to back up about three feet and set a standard that keeps you from the yellow line. It may be something financially you're doing. It may be something in a relationship. 
You may be married, and there's this guy or this girl at work, and you know, nothing has happened yet, but oh man, you're walking a closed line. Something so close that if your spouse caught you, you would feel bad about it. And as you listen to this message, there's something inside of you going, <clears throat> let me tell you, that's the Holy Spirit talking to you. It's God who says, call me Father. He's saying to you, I want to rescue you. I don't want to keep you from doing something good. I want to rescue you from something bad. You need a guardrail in your life. And then maybe there's an area of your life where once you get closer and closer and closer to, you're so overwhelmed with lust that you, you really lose all kinds of self-control in that area. So what would it look like for you to back up a little bit to someplace safe and put a guardrail in the ground that maybe none of your friends or any of your buddies would ever understand? But it just may be the thing that God uses to rescue your marriage. What would that look like? I don't know what it is for you. I know where it is for me. I know where I've set guardrails in my life. But while I've been talking, I have a feeling that some things have come to your mind. And my hunch is, whatever come to your mind is where God would like you to start with in your life. That's where he wants you to start. And the best news is that you don't have to listen to five more messages to, for this to start. You don't have to listen. You haven't seen it for four weeks. Like, All right, I'm going to start now. Because chances are, between here and the door, you know where you need to plant that first guardrail. You know where you need a personal standard of behavior that informs and energizes your conscience. And I promise you, I promise you this, based on scripture and personal experiences, this, no one has ever regretted establishing a guardrail ever. No one. But there are plenty of us, myself included, there are plenty of people who can look back and wish that they had. So I want you to think about it this week. This is what I want you to think about. And I want you to face up to what you know in your heart your Heavenly Father wants you to do. Heavenly Father, thank you for a great, wonderful day today, Father. We thank you so much, Lord, for speaking to us this morning, Lord. We thank you for bringing us a message, Father, of how good you are. That you would actually set up rules for us, Father. That you, would, you want us to live to a standard, Father. And Lord, I ask this week that your Holy Spirit would speak to us. Would it bring up where we need to establish guardrails, Father? Where we need protection, Lord. Father, we don't want to fall into the abyss. We don't want to fall to the ditch to the left and the right, Father. We want to stay on the true straight and narrow path to you, Father. And Lord, we just ask, Lord, of all these things, Father, that above all else, your name would be praised. In your holy name, amen. Folks, George Smith, have a wonderful week. We'll see you next week. Well, that brings us to the conclusion of today's service. I'm so glad that you joined us. Hey, if you're ever in our area, that's Skowhegan, Maine, and you'd like to visit us for one of our worship services, we're located here at 31 East Madison Road, and our services are every Sunday at 10 a.m., and we'd love to have you. Now, uh, if you want to know more about us, our website is nhccskowhegan.org. Well, God bless you, and we'll see you next week for a better life. Impossible, life has brought me to my knees. God.